your magic never lasts. Bibi quickly raised her arms and blurted out, Eeny meeny, pen between fingers, is now a swarm of bees with stingers. Whiz whiz. Mrs. Martin threw an uncomfortable glance at the pen with which she was about to sign the contract, as she suddenly found herself gripping a purple carrot. Of course, she immediately knew who was responsible for this and openly chided the young witch. BB? BB shrugged her shoulders. Sorry, but Tina interrupted and turned angrily toward her mother. You really want to sell the paddock? Annoyed, Roger also interfered. Yes, and then we'll finally have money for feed again. Kim Win Win handed Mrs. Martin a new pen and offered a pleading, slightly impatient look. You will certainly not regret it. Tina took her brother to task. Why don't you think about us, about the farm? It's about a paddock, Tina, Roger retorted. Tina shouted. It's about everything, Roger. This is my home, too. Roger burst out angrily. Okay, we have a real problem here, Tina, he pointed at Kim. Kim doesn't only think about herself, she also thinks ahead, just like I do. And if you can't see that, he stared straight at Bibi, then you can do all the work around here. We will, Tina replied defiantly. Oh, honestly, Roger barked. Who will take care of everything? The horses, the finances, the food? While you go galloping about having all the fun, you're always out having fun. Tina took a deep breath. Look, we... Roger interrupted her again angrily. Tina, did it ever cross your mind that maybe I would like to do something completely different? Tina hadn't expected this. Unmoved by the sibling's quarrel, Kim Win Win had her eyes locked on Bibi. A triumphant smile widened across her face. Even this little brat's magic couldn't stop her business plan, no matter what she came up with. Bibi's mind raced feverishly for a good idea. Finally, Mrs. Martin put her foot down and silenced her two bickering children. Roger is right. She reached for the new pen that Kim Win Win had given her. Tina shouted, Mom, no! Bibi raised her arms. Eeny meeny, quick convert, gravel into useless dirt, whiz whiz. Really now, Bibi, you cannot be serious, cried Mrs. Martin. What was the matter with these girls? She grabbed one of the small glasses with Kim's samples that lay on the table in front of her. Instead of fine gravel, there was now dark brown earth in it. There must be another solution. Everything is already so messed up here anyways, Bibi defended herself. Without missing a beat, Kim simply announced, Not to worry, Mrs. Martin. She turned to Bibi with that familiar, knowing smile playing around the corners of her mouth. Your magic will never last. Soon there will be gravel again. You cannot stop the things that really matter, you know. As a confirmation, Mrs. Martin signed the contract. Tina sighed desperately as Bibi looked at her sympathetically. What else could they possibly do? Billy the Kid came to the table and snapped at the carrot, but Roger quickly pulled it back. Better not, Billy. Otherwise, you'll have a ballpoint pen in your stomach when Bibi's spell wears off. Caramba! Meanwhile, over at Falkenstein Castle, Chico and Alex played croquet in the dark. Despite having never held a mallet before, Chico was quite an accomplished player, maneuvering his colorful wooden ball through the small metal hoops. Both Bibi and Tina were dismayed when they finally reached the castle and saw the boys. Surely this was no time for games. What are you doing? Bibi asked anxiously. Alex replied calmly, We're enjoying this perfect day. He hadn't played croquet for a long time, but with Chico he felt like he could go on for hours. The two boys were too concentrated on getting the ball through the hoops again to notice how distraught the girls were. But then Tina told them what had happened at Martin's farm. She was not about to sit back and let it all go. We have to do something. Then she placed a hand softly on Alex's shoulder. Alex, please, you always know what to do. But her boyfriend just shrugged hopelessly. Once Mrs. Martin had signed, there was nothing more to be done. Tina erupted all at once. It's because of Roger. I don't know what he's got going on with this Kim Win Win. But Chico defended Roger. He already does most of the work on the farm. He had experienced this firsthand while living there over the past several days. Roger was tirelessly at his mother's side, taking care of everything. And of course, it was stupid that the paddock no longer belonged to Martin's farm. 
But it wasn't as dramatic as Bibi looked and Tina spoke. Chico simply didn't understand why the two of them let themselves get so down. Bibi looked despairingly at Chico. It wasn't only the paddock, but Kim's words that were troubling her. Your witchcraft will never last. The dirt had, in fact, long since turned back into precious gravel, but she lacked the will to explain it all to Chico. We've been through so much together this summer. We don't want to ruin it all now, do we? Alex tried to maintain a positive mood. Tina contradicted sadly. Yeah, if it was only that simple. But Chico agreed with Alex. If you think all is lost, just wait. There's more to come. When the others stared at him bewildered, he explained. That's an old proverb. And does that mean things are going to get worse? Bibi asked. Somehow it seemed fitting. Chico threw her a confused look. He hadn't really wanted to express it that way. Alex smiled. It wasn't quite right. They say, when you think everything is lost, a little light always shines from somewhere. Eso, that's what I wanted to say. The two boys hugged each other. All of this excitement had bonded them even tighter. Tina had to smile a little. You're a really great team. Alex felt the same way. Claro, brothers in spirit. So now it's time to pick up our heads. Chico clapped his hands. Caramba! Alex nodded, and all of a sudden he had an idea. We'll start by informing everybody, and I already know how. Alex's plan. Funky Farnsworth eyed Alex disapprovingly, who stood in front of her desk fidgeting with a paperclip. Beside him stood Chico, who had accompanied him on the mission to Radio Flamingo. You know I adore you, Alexander, said Funky. You are sweet, you're creative, but what on earth am I supposed to do with all of this? Weather forecasts, love songs, bees, unexpected announcements in the middle of everything, and not even coming in to inform me first? Then this business at the inn, nothing, no usable information, and now I have to plan a new program at the last minute. She took a deep breath. Alex used a short silence to get off his chest what he wanted to say. Reschedule. That's a good keyword. Chico nodded. See, this is exactly why we are here. Funky gazed at him, astonished. We? We are holding a live festival at Martin's Farm, Alex added excitedly. A super cool location with a huge stage, Chico continued. Everybody will come, including everyone who has played here before, like Chico, for example. Alex pointed to his friend, who nodded in agreement. And the whole thing will be broadcast exclusively by Radio Flamingo. Ad-free, unbiased, and impeccable. Alex took a deep breath. Funky looked from one boy to another, amused, though not thoroughly convinced by their sales pitch. Let's not exaggerate. Huge, super cool, exclusive, and just how do you plan to get it all up so fast? Alex put his arm around Chico's shoulder and smiled. Family, friends, all together. And I won't let you down this time either. I promise. The two looked pleadingly at Fungi. After a long pause, she finally agreed. Then added, I hope so. Otherwise, your internship will be in the dumpster. This was not enough for Alex. And he asked one more time. Does that mean yes? Fungi rolled her eyes. Yes, yes. And now let me be, please. I have to prepare an interview here. Speak of the Devil On a bench outside the pink house where Radio Flamingo was located, B.B. Bloxburg waited sullenly, head in hands. Tina quickly got two ice creams and handed her one. Feel good food, she said. But even a scoop of mango coconut swirl could not cheer B.B. up. Sighing, she looked at Tina. Sorry, I know you have more reason to be in a bad mood than I, but Martin's Farm is my home too, and what can I do? My stupid spells don't help at all. Is that what this is all about? Tina asked in surprise. Hey, Bibi, just because it didn't work once. They never really work, Bibi objected. Nor do they even last long enough. And that's what really counts, doesn't it? Kim is right. Tina couldn't believe her ears. Kim is right? Man, Bibi, your magic has helped so many times. Imagine if you hadn't used it when Allegro ran into the street. Or when you rescued the wild pigs. Bibi looked at her hesitantly. Really? Heck yes, Tina affirmed. Don't let this Kim woman get into your head. Bibi's eyes widened in astonishment. Speak of the devil. For as soon as Tina had finished her sentence, 
She watched as Kim Win Win ran straight towards the entrance of Radio Flamingo. When she saw Bibi and Tina on the bench, she sneered and winked at them. Then she disappeared without a word into the house. A bigger project than expected. Kim Win Win was the interview guest who Funky Farnsworth was expecting. The two women sat opposite each other in the studio, both wearing headphones and ready for the interview. Bibi and Tina stood next to Alex and Chico outside the cutoff window to the studio and followed the interview live, on location. Full of vigor, Funky announced into the microphone. The world is our guest here in Redwell. This is Funky Farnsworth, and you're listening to Radio Flamingo. Ad-free, unbiased, and impeccable. We are honored to have Mrs. Kim Win Win join us in the studio today to talk about a sizable investment in the Falkenstein community, one that aims to create many new jobs. The young businesswoman had Funky firmly in her sights, which somehow unsettled her. What did these eyes want to tell her? But then Kim replied in a perfectly dignified and friendly manner. The pleasure is all mine, and I would like to thank all the kind people of Falkenstein, Redwell, and the whole surrounding districts who have given me their land for this great project. What? Bibi asked outside the window. Had she heard correctly? Tina was in disbelief. That means we're not the only ones who are leaving their land. And she's not only digging with us, but also with the neighbors? Then the gravel pit will be much bigger than we thought, Alex concluded. Chico nodded, aghast. Que mierda! The four friends looked at each other in shock. Kim, on the other hand, continued enthusiastically about her project. Gravel is the material from which emerging cities are made, she told radio listeners. And I believe in a glorious future for this region. Again, Kim fixed Funky with her gaze, to the point where the host shifted somewhat uneasily in her chair. But she couldn't phase Bibi, who stood watching on the other side of the soundproof glass. Well, I do too, she declared, but not the way you see it, Miss Kim Win Win. A glorious future for Bibi was not one characterized solely by riches. When the interview had finished, Kim left the studio with a nimble pace and made her way across the street. She was startled when someone suddenly jumped in front of her, blocking the way. It was Bibi, with a pugnacious glint in her eyes. If you believe in a future here, then you ought to follow a few basic rules, she said. Kim looked disparagingly at the girl. You again. Don't you know it's rude to tell guests how to behave? Bibi replied. Oh, you're a fan of etiquette. Good. Around here, we like to show our personal gratitude. Why don't you come to our festival tonight? Everyone will be there. Kim remained motionless. Then Bibi added, Even Roger. Tina, Alex, and Chico exchanged a surprised look. Kim's face distorted into a wry smile, but then she nodded. Thank you for the invitation, she said, moving briskly around Bibi and leaving the four friends behind. Bibi turned to Tina, Alex, and Chico, who were clearly confused by the whole interaction. But Bibi grinned and shrugged. Embrace your enemy. Tina shook her head in disbelief. I hope you have a plan. Chico grinned broadly. Caramba, that's the Bibi I know. At last, Bibi's fighting spirit had returned. Time will come, plan will come. Preparations for Falkenstein Festival were in full swing. On one side of the courtyard stood a small, wonderfully decorated stage. Across the yard on the other side hung old lampshades, into which Chico screwed multicolored light bulbs. Bibi proudly observed how beautiful everything was all due to great teamwork. When her eyes met Chico's, they smiled at each other. Bibi stood at the drink stand together with Tina. The friends had built a rustic looking bar by fastening a wooden plank to a stack of hay bales. They had even organized a mobile sauna, which was parked in front of the big barn. Tina checked a list of the musician's performance times, reading out what she had written down. Dora and the mermaids, Freddy, she looked at Bibi. But before that, your precious Chico, Bibi snorted. My precious Chico? Tina smiled. Well, he's not mine. Bibi only rolled her eyes as Tina went back to the planning. The lineup is great. Freddy, Hank, and Klops were just setting up their instruments. Tools from the blacksmith's shop, like a hammer and anvil. Old barrels and a washboard were used for the drum kit. And Freddy, of course, had his guitar with him. They were excited and nervous before their first big gig. 
being on stage in front of all the guests was something quite different than the small show at the radio station. Alex concentrated like a pro on setting up the microphone and monitors. Microphone check. One, two, three. What's your plan now, when Kim comes? Tina wanted to know. Bibi just shrugged. When the time comes, the plan will come, she said. All I know is, if everybody sees the consequences, then they won't make so many mistakes. Mrs. Martin had found some treats for the guests in the house and called for Elena, who took them out to the courtyard. The two women were about the same size, so Elena could borrow some extra clothes from Suzanne for the special occasion. Newly dressed, Elena came down the stairs and called out enthusiastically. Susanita, it is no wonder that Chico feels so comfortable here. You are so sweet, and this farm is so beautiful. Mrs. Martin smiled somewhat thoughtfully. Thank you, but I only hope I have done the right thing. This gravel pit, it will be much bigger than expected. Elena did not understand. Gravel pit? This sounded like an unsolved problem. The two women quickly made their way outside. Whistling and singing happily, Kim Win Win drove along the access road to Martin's farm on a scooter, past parked cars, and a few other guests who she greeted like old friends. This new arrival had made herself known and loved everywhere in a remarkably short time. She was surprised to discover Roger, who was already waiting for her at the entrance, above which a painted banner welcomed visitors to the festival. I thought it might be better if we went in together, he explained to her. Kim looked at him with a touch of amusement and simply replied, Good. They walked the path towards the farm, past the riding grounds where three little ponies were romping around. Roger felt uneasy. He just didn't know how to approach Kim about his predicament. You know, my sister doesn't speak well of you at the moment, he began. Good, Kim replied. Good? Roger repeated, baffled by this response. But she quickly changed the subject. Could you help me? She asked, pushing her scooter towards him. Roger took it over, polite as he was, but returned to his concerns. Still, Kim, you could have told me how big your plan was. Kim smiled. The fact that it is so big doesn't make it bad. She continued in Japanese, completely incomprehensible to Roger, before turning to him and translating. The whole world should participate in our wealth. What is that supposed to mean? Roger pleaded. This woman drove him crazy and confused him. And yet, or perhaps precisely because of that, he liked her so much. The whole world shall participate in our wealth, said Kim. Your sister will soon understand that too. The other contracts will be signed soon, and then I'll be on my way to Tokyo, home base. Roger swallowed. Wait, somehow you're always just going away, Kim looked deep into his eyes. Maybe you want to come this time? Then she added lightly, The mill farmer is coming too. Roger stared at her in disbelief. What is he going to do in Tokyo? We're going on a journey, explained Kim, moving further ahead towards the farm. The first guitar sounds were already ringing out. Bewildered, Roger followed after her. Wait a minute, Kim! Full speed ahead. Sound check had started on stage. Freddy ripped into the first chords on his guitar while the blacksmiths hammered the rhythm of their song, Animal Conference. Alex stood beside Chico at the mixing desk, trying desperately to adjust the sound of this much power. The song suited Freddy and his friends perfectly. Alex was energized by the message because the lyrics called on everyone to imagine what would happen if people and animals would change their roles. Freddy raved across the stage while belting out the chorus. For the bridge, the boys had come up with a choreography especially for the show. Hank did a backflip from the stage. Klops hit the old barrel with sweeping movements, and Freddy lifted his guitar to introduce the band. Then he suddenly smashed the entire instrument with all his might onto the stage floor. Wham! The guitar neck broke off while the body dangled and swung around by the strings, clanging and reverberating through the amplifier. Everybody watched him, horrified, as he continued to splinter his guitar on the stage floor, screaming, We are Freddy and the Blacksmiths! What are you doing? cried Alex, as much in shock as all the other spectators. You gotta try out new tricks once in a while, joked Freddy. Alex replied, annoyed. But that was only a rehearsal. Did everything have to go wrong already? Freddy didn't seem to care much about that. With us, it's always full speed ahead. 
And how are we supposed to perform again now? Hank asked. We'll just get a new one, answered Freddy. On the fly? This was our first gig. Hank and Klops were furious. Chico tried to calm the band down. Listen, it is no problem. I am going to start, and you guys can come on later. The grand finale. That's much better, isn't it? Alex offered in support. The blacksmiths liked it too. Freddy grinned broadly. Finale, boys! Alex gave them a sign. Yes, then pack up here first, please. Bibi and Tina looked on, amused by how this all unfolded. Freddy again. But now the guests had to be greeted first. There were so many. They hadn't expected such a reception. No Falkensteiner wanted to miss the spectacle, no matter how old. At that moment, they discovered Kim Win-Win, who, together with Roger, was heading determinedly for the mill farmer, Mrs. Sauer, and Mr. Quigley, who had also just arrived. The Club of Yellow Scarves, Bibi remarked. Tina nodded in frustration. Of course, they all got that from Kim, and Roger is also playing the part. Ah, the trappings of love, said Bibi, shrugging her shoulders. I'm just saying, keep your eyes open when choosing a partner. Tina added snappily. Bibi nodded in agreement. And I'm going to show Kim the octopus what's what. With that, she made her way to the stage with Tina close behind. Was now the time for Bibi's plan? Kim Win Win was glowing when she met up with the Yellow Scarves Club. Hello, everybody. My peer group, she said. Count Falco kissed her hand in gentlemanly fashion and greeted her effusively. Mrs. Win Win, the sun is rising. The comparison was not far off, considering how Kim was wearing her elegant trouser suit, the yellow color of which outshone everything else. It also grabbed the attention of Elena and Mrs. Martin, who had just left the house. Ecclebert pushed himself hastily with his tray between Kim and his boss, as he was deeply suspicious of the former. But Kim was not to be put off. The young businesswoman handed out drinks to her peer group and called, Let's toast our project together. Even Roger joined in the toast, as Tina was stunned to discover. Hey guys, everybody, listen up, please. A voice sounded from the stage, interrupting the cheerful tribute. Bibi was standing on stage with the microphone, trying to draw attention to herself. The festival guests stopped talking and turned their attention to the young Miss Bloxburg. Kim Win Win feared that Bibi was again aiming to disrupt her work. Tina, Alex, and Chico followed Bibi onto the stage and listened intently to what she had planned. As most of you know, I spend my summer here at Martin's farm every year, she continued, because I love it here. Klops, who was also on stage with Freddie and Hank, complained. Boring, Hank shouted. This is a festival and not a chatable. Freddie gave them a sign to be quiet. Or do you want Bibi to cast another spell on you? Hank and Klops shook their heads. No way. Being a mermaid once was really enough for them. Nothing against change, Bibi continued her speech. But one should never lose sight of what change can mean. With this, she handed the microphone over to Freddy and raised her hands. Hank and Klops averted their eyes in fear, but Bibi had her sights on Kim Win Win and her peer group. Eeny meeny, we all must travel. To the future, Falkenstein gravel. Whiz, whiz. In the pit. Tina, Alex, and Chico stared at their new surroundings, dumbfounded. What once was a stage was now an immense gravel pit. They were joined by Bibi, as well as all the others who had just been on stage or standing together with Kim Win Win. Roger, Kim Win Win, Count Falco, Ecclebert, the mill farmer. Mrs. Sauer and Mr. Quigley formed a small group on one side. Opposite them were Bibi, Tina, Alex, Chico, Mrs. Martin, Elena, and next to them, Freddy, Hank, and Klops, who had no idea what had happened owing to the fact that they still had not heard anything at all about Kim Win Win's business. The heat was unbearable as the sun beat down oppressively from above. It was dead quiet in the huge, bare pit. Except for a light whistling wind, there wasn't a single sound. Everyone looked around uncomfortably. Yuri, Count Falco finally uttered. I'm thirsty somehow, Freddy said. Does anybody hear any birds? Asked Mrs. Martin. Nothing is even growing here anymore. Klops moaned. Well, I certainly don't want to be here. Bibi nodded urgently. 
I can understand that, and I can also bring you back again. But when it really gets to this point, then I can no longer change anything anymore, and then it will look exactly like what you see all around you. Nothing but a pit. Kim shook her head annoyed. Always this nonsense, B.B. Blocksburg. It's not nonsense, Tina retorted. If anyone here isn't acting responsibly, then it's you. Even Roger had to agree with his sister. He looked at Kim apologetically. Sorry, Kim, but I can't bear this ugly view. I don't want to be a part of your plans anymore. His words stung the young woman. Not even to Tokyo? Kim asked. Mrs. Martin and Tina turned to each other in amazement. Tokyo? Roger shook his head. Kim looked at him without understanding. But, Roger interrupted her. No buts. Everything he needed to say had been said, even if it was difficult. He liked Kim very much, but Roger knew what he had to do. Looking to the other group across the gravel pit, he walked slowly across and stood beside his family. Yes, there is a but, Mrs. Martin murmured with dread. I have already signed the whole contract. Bibi lowered her eyes, concerned. Was there really no turning back? Kim smiled confidently, sensing victory. The wind whistled around their ears. Disillusionment was spreading. The gravel was only ever about business. Nothing else seemed to matter to Kim. Count Falco spoke up. But I haven't signed yet. With a great dramatic gesture, he threw Kim's gifted scarf into the sand and shouted, and I'm not selling. Then he went to Mrs. Martin and announced nobly, As far as food supply, Suzanne, we can solve that too. There's nothing here to nourish the bees either, Ecclebert concluded before following Count Falco. Kim Win-Win shook her head in disbelief as Mrs. Sauer and Mr. Quigley also turned away from her. Only the mill farmer proposed a compromise. We'll find a way to get the feed, right? I still have something in stock, but we can still do the gravel. I'll make a bathing lake out of it later. Then you can go swimming for free. You'd all like that so much. But when his offer received only scornful looks instead of approval, he fell silent. He didn't want to stand there all alone either. Kim Win-Win stiffened at the realization that she could no longer captain her ship of money-making dreams. She had lost. Bibi quickly raised her hands again and cast a spell. Eeny meeny, future's door. Bring us back to times before. Whiz, whiz. Fiesta Falkenstina. The festival could finally kick off. Funky Farnsworth stood on stage and gave the starting signal. Welcome to the Falkenstein Festival at Martin's Farm. I'm Funky Farnsworth from Radio Flamingo, and I'm glad that you're all here. She lowered the microphone as she looked around, confused. Funky now realized that a few people were missing including her trainee, who had always announced everything so well. Where is everybody? She said acoustically. At that moment, Bibi, Tina, Alex, and Chico appeared on the stage right next to her, and at the same time, an infectious Spanish beat filled the air. Simply too cool. Chico began to sing. He shot a glance at Bibi, who was radiant. Alex grinned knowingly and nudged Tina. Are Bibi and Chico actually together now? Tina shrugged her shoulders. Why do you always have to name everything as you see it? Maybe Bibi and Chico were together. Maybe they were just soulmates. Who knew? But it was quite obvious that the two were very close. Both Bibi and Chico were happy to have found true friendship, in the same way Tina and Alex celebrated theirs. After all, friendship united all four of them. They all danced in celebration. Even Freddie joined in to sing along. Roger walked over to Kim Win-Win, who stood off to the side watching everything from a distance. She had wanted to leave long ago, but something was keeping her there. Smiling through a touch of sadness, she spoke. Somehow, I am a little envious. Your support for one another is really beautiful. Roger pulled her onto the dance floor, insisting she join in with everyone else. After all, nobody was resentful here. Even Count Falco danced first with Mrs. Martin, then with Elena, and then with both at the same time, soaking himself in perspiration. Commendable, sir, what your son has put together, praised Ecclebert. Thanks to the internship. This time, Count Falco did not contradict his butler. But did this funky Farnsworth woman really have to dance with him now? She called out to him gleefully. 
Count Falco, at last, I would so love to interview you. Perhaps another time, replied the Count. Three women, that was a little too much for him now. While the party was in full swing, a detective appeared with two uniformed police officers. They pushed their way through the crowd and then stopped in front of Alex's father. Count Falco von Falkenstein, the detective asked. Yes, that is I, Count Falco confirmed in surprise. You're temporarily under arrest, said the official. Turn around. Count Falco was flummoxed. Excuse me, but one of the policewomen had already secured his arms and placed the handcuffs on him. Bibi, Tina, Alex, and Chico stopped singing. This could not be true. Only Funky Farnsworth seemed a touch too satisfied. Finally, in the right place at the right time, she pulled out her microphone and held it in front of the detective, who paid her no attention. Horrified, the friends looked up at the officers who were now leading Count Falco von Falkenstein through the crowd. Bibi was the first to free herself from paralysis and uttered combatively, Eeny meeny, secrets heard. We're coming back. Spread the word. Whiz, whiz. 